there. Welcome to Off Duty. I'm Wendy Bounds. Well, with warm weather comes spring concerts, and while most of us are chained to our desks, our own Jim Fusilli, he does not have that problem. He is off to the Coachella Music Festival, and he stopped by to give Off Duty a preview of what he's going to hear. Well, it's called the Coachella Festival, and it's an art and music festival, of course. Our critic, Jim Facilli, gets to go. He gets all the fun assignments, and he does a great job covering them. How so, are you? So you, you have, a, you have a, a passion for spending three days in the desert <laughs> listening to several hundred bands? Is that, that's a plum well, assignment? Hey, you know, it's not South by Southwest. You don't have to do that. But, um, yeah, it's uh, not in the desert. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this is a very unique one in many other ways. Can you explain uh, what's unique about it? Yeah. Uh, the. the, the this, uh, the promoters have, have rightfully uh, decided that people want to be at big festivals with lots of bands. And they usually held it uh, over three consecutive days over one weekend. But this year they're holding it over three consecutive days on back-to-back -back weekends with the same bands performing. So, uh, you know, it's not like they cut the tickets in half for the first weekend. Right. They just have this huge demand for big festivals and they're going to satisfy it. Uh, what are the three bands you're most excited about? Well that's the other thing about this festival that's so good this year is there's such an emphasis on new emerging bands. If you look at the headliners, Radiohead, The Black Keys and Snoop Dogg with Dr. Dre, uh, these are these are well-known acts at this point. Yeah. But if you go down the bill, uh, you, you, you see a lot of bands that are, that are on the verge of something, and it's it's a gig like Coachella that could prove it. You have a a band like Sp uh, Swedish House Mafia that sells out Madison Square Garden for electronic fans, but can it cross over to a mainstream pop fan base, or does it want to? Because mm -hmm. it's satisfied with what it has. You have bands like Mickey Snow and Kasabian and uh, a folk singer like Laura Marlin, who are on the verge of moving into the next level. Um, in the past, um, we've asked you about what surprised you most with South by Southwest. When you've gone to this before, what has surprised you the most about the event? The depth of talent. Okay. You know, the doors open at, a, at noon, and they go very, very late into the night. If you show up at noon, you may walk over to a tent that has 100 people watching the act play. Unbelievable. And they'll be fantastic. Yeah. And two years later, they'll move on to a bigger stage. You know, the Black Keys started on a small stage. Is, is this a pretty influential event in terms of uh, breaking bands? I mean, you get an opportunity to perform at the same uh, thing as Radiohead, yeah. some of the most prominent bands. I think it is. I, th I think for a band that's uh, on the way up, that is, has proven that they can play and write and sing and arrange, uh, to get exposure uh, to a big, big fan base of an already established group can mean a lot. Mm -hmm. And the industry is there also, and that's another big thing. So they stay in the tents, all the, all the executives, the A&Rs and all they, they, they move around. There are two huge, <laughs> two huge outdoor stages, and generally thousands and thousands and thousands of people congregate in front of those two stages. But I remember a couple of years ago, Florence and the Machine played at a small tent, and the fans were, were hip to Florence and the Machine more so than the industry was because it was clear they needed to be on a bigger stage. It was just packed with people. The, the tent was overflowing with people. Now this year Florence and the Machine will be on a big stage. Well, that's the energy level that every band uh, dreams about to capture at an event like this. Okay, so you'll come and talk to us after uh, you come back. Sure will. The Masters doled out its signature green jacket this weekend, and for those of you who have not had your fill of the golf greens, we have a fascinating tale right now about a man who designs golf courses for a living. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> Looks pretty darn good. I'm Bill Coor. I'm a partner in the firm of Coor & Crenshaw. We're in the business of golf design and we try to create a few interesting golf courses. The creative process requires a bit of risk and, and walking on the edge occasionally. And certainly we do uh, things that we know from a golf standpoint are, uh, well, I guess the current term would be edgy and <laughs> a bit risky. First thing, study the property. To us, it is absolutely evolutionary. We don't start off with preconceived notions of 
an exact plan. The courses don't look contrived. They don't look artificial. They don't look or feel like they've been made by man. The best are the ones that reveal themselves slowly. You play them over and over, and all of a sudden one day you've played a golf course many, many times, and you say, I've never been in this position. I've never had this shot. I've never been faced with this, this thought or this decision. You have to have an element there of where you feel like people are experiencing it. They want to experience it again. Florida has such a history of fantastic golf courses, but generally speaking, they're not on dramatic landscapes. And this um, is one of the most dramatic and unusual landscapes you would see in America. If you were to cast your eyes around this property, you see everything from massive dunes, the entire site is sand, and it's interspersed with lakes. He looked upon this amazing landscape as, as we see today, and it was no different. The only difference that's occurred here, Keith and the guys have literally, they've hollowed out some areas in the dunes and ridges that were here to create bunkers. As you get to the landing area, just look at it and see what you think, if, if you could, what your thoughts would be. Frustration enters into golf a lot when you think you're competing against the person who did the golf course, when it's man against man, when it's man against nature. It's far more interesting and it's far more palatable when you don't succeed. Well, he gave you Maury Povich and now our own Lee Hawkins is back with a one-on-one -on -one interview with Jerry Springer. No chairs were harmed in the filming of this package, I promise. Roll the story. very difficult in today's world to, to be the president. There's just, you know, whichever party. I, no, I, yeah, I, I think Obama will win. This is a side of Jerry Springer that we rarely see, but for those of you who think you know Jerry Springer, you probably don't know the fact that he actually was a politician and he actually has a law degree and practiced law. We're sitting with him today to talk about his career and all of the things he's done. Well, thank you. So if you have a legal problem, call Jerry at 1-800. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> and, and, and we were talking about politics. I was going to do a formal introduction, but I think uh, that was a good way to start it. Uh, Jerry, you have become an icon, a cultural icon in television. You're one of the kings of tabloid television. I'd like to apologize. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Do you really mean that? Well, no, not really. Uh, we, we're not really tabloid. And, and what I mean, but we're crazy and stupid. And it's the most outrageous thing on television, perhaps. At least it was for a while. Now I'm not so sure it is. But we're <laughs> clearly over the top. If you're known, you can't be on the show. In other words, we don't do celebrities. Uh, Why not? Because our show is, by definition, about regular people involved in outrageous situations. Or, right, okay. So we don't, you know, other shows get famous guests. If you're known, you're not allowed to be on the show. And so once again, this is an everyday man's Shakespearean tragedy played out before. The guests may not hour. use that term, Shakespearean <laughs> tragedy. <laughs> but you have a lot of the same themes. Yes. I... As you may know, there's an opera out, or has been out, it came out in England for several years, and now it's been touring the States, uh, Jerry Springer, the opera, which I have nothing to do with. It's about me, but I didn't, and about our show, but I had nothing to do with to it. To add one more thing to all the things you're doing. Well, that's because my mother always wanted me to have culture. <laughs> so now I could say, Mom, I got culture, I'm an opera. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, and what the opera is, you know, at first you say, how can you have an opera and the Jerry Springer show in the same sentence. And yet, I always thought country music was my show put to music. But once I saw the opera, I realized, oh my gosh, opera is my show put to music. Mm -hmm. Because it's got all the traditional themes of opera. Uh, it has the chanting chorus, the gender misidentification, the mock tragedy, the farce, um, the comedy the anger. So everything you see in going to a, an opera, 
you see on our show, except without the music. We can't afford the orchestra, it's so expensive. <laughs> before, before they step on the carpet, their lives had been horrible. They step out there all of a sudden. They're like in the light. They've gone to heaven. It's um, common to say, oh, they want their 15 minutes of fame, you know, right. the Andy Warhol line. But that's not true at all, because first of all, they don't get any fame because they even use fake names. Or they can wear disguises. So there's no fame from this. How long will you be doing this? I have let uh, NBC know that I am stopping uh, when I'm 104. Okay. okay. So that's it. Because I want to be able to re enjoy my retirement. <laughs> See, we kept that pretty clean. And now we're going to end the show with an unconventional twist on a breakfast staple, Kitty Greenwald of Slow Food Fast. She shows us how to deep fry a pancake without it falling apart. This I gotta see. Hi, I'm Kitty Greenwald and this is Slow Food Fast. Today we're making a recipe from Martin Picard up in Montreal. And it's a recipe for deep fried pancakes with maple raspberry cream syrup. So it's a regular pancake batter more or less, except it takes corn starch. Here we have two cups and two tablespoons flour. To that, I'm gonna add two and a half tablespoons of corn starch two teaspoons baking powder, a pinch of salt. This recipe doesn't call for much sugar because the maple syrup has enough sugar to carry the dish. So I'm gonna whisk that together first. All right, I'm gonna beat three eggs and two cups milk. This recipe does not skimp on calories and I recommend you not worry about it. So whisk that till it's well blended. It's good to beat them well enough so that the whites and the yolks become as uniform as you can possibly get them. And now we mix the two together. You can stir the wet into the dry or the other way around and slowly incorporate it. This is sort of the kid-friendly part. After this comes together and you get as many lumps out as you can, I'm gonna let that sit. So now we're gonna heat the oil over medium heat. And this is about two inches of canola oil. You wanna keep your oil at a regulated temperature. And in this instance, it's around 350 degrees. And it's hot oil, so you do have to be careful. When frying, you do not wanna be distracted. So I'm gonna set up my station, basically. So the oil's been on for a few minutes and we can do a test run. What you want is to just put in a little bit and see what how the reaction is. So it's starting to fizzle a bit around the edges. That's sort of the right temperature. We're gonna do about a quarter cup of batter per cake and just pour it in. So I'm not putting in more than three. Also, there's not really that much space. I have a bowl nearby so that you can easily skim. So I'm spooning the hot oil over the cakes. It helps ensure even cooking. So now you're cooking the top and the bottom. And let it fry for about two minutes per side. You want a rich golden color on the outside. Okay, good. That looks good, right? And then you get a rhythm going. You don't want the burnt flavor in the oil, so you want to get those like little crispies out of there. So I think that is the very definition of golden. And now we're gonna quickly assemble the maple syrup. I'm gonna move the oil to the side, bring this pot over. Add one cup of pure maple syrup. Once that comes to a boil, add the cream. It'll bring down the temperature right away. And then stir in your raspberries. And you just stir till the berries are heated through. Let this cook for about one minute. And I'm gonna plate. Let's pick some nice ones. And this guy, spoon some of this lovely sauce over top. You wanna to get some berries. I mean, that looks great. And that is a nice breakfast slash dessert. Okay, so the inside is nice and light. The outside is crispy and doused in a very seductive sauce. We did it. So congratulations, and I hope you enjoy. Yum, I know what I'm doing this weekend. That's it for today's WSJ Off Duty. Please click a button to subscribe, join us on Facebook and Twitter, and join us later in the week when singer-songwriter Dar Williams is here for an interview and to play two of her newest songs. Until then, I'm Wendy Bounds. I'll see you tomorrow.